Things are changing with the Walt Disney Company when it comes to their Disney board vote that is just now days away. Nelson Peltz wants the board. He wants to bring Jay Rusulo, Disney, desperate to keep him away from it. But a huge investing firm has declared that institutional investors should back Peltz. Hello folks, welcome back to the Pro Channel. It is a joy as ever that you are here with us as we continue endeavoring to explain entertainment and keep you ahead of the culture curve. Joining us today for this fantastic topic, a fantastic panel, Vash Sky, Lauren Connor, Culture Casino, and Jonas J. Campbell. Welcome to you all. Indubitably. Thanks for having us. All right, folks, if you thought that it was going to go easy this next week, if you thought the news was going to ramp down and de-escalation was going to occur for Disney versus Pelts, think again, Bob Iger is very scared. And now we are getting into that stage where at the end of a campaign, usually political, but in this case corporate, it's time to start throwing serious mud. This, courtesy of Reuters, by Don Chivalewski. Why do I need an all-black cast? Disney criticizes Pelt's remarks. Now it's time to start taking quotes out of context and start making it look like Mr. Pelt's is an ist a phobe, all kinds of terrible things. Here's the article. The Walt Disney Company on Friday said that remarks by activist investor Nelson Pelt's criticizing the company for making movies dominated by female and black actors is evidence that he shouldn't be on Disney's board. Pelt's, whose fight to join Disney as director has become one of the year's most bitter and closely watched board battles in an interview with the Financial Times. He said Disney films have become too focused on delivering a message, a.k.a. what we talk about here so often, propagandizing. Uh, then he said, it's not enough quality storytelling. All right, we're all on board with that. But then he specifically took issue with the Marvels and Black Panther. All right, so the Marvels, I don't think we can quibble with. That was a financial failure. How bad? Well, it's one of the worst financial uh, failures in the history of cinema. It might actually be the worst, but we're waiting on tax uh, forms from the UK to decide is Indiana Jones 5 worse. That's how bad it is. Why do I have to have a Marvel that's all women? This is Nelson Peltz again. Not that I have anything against women. There's the key thing they leave out of the headline, right? Not that I have anything against women. He has a wife, he has daughters, his daughters in Hollywood. But why do I have to do that? Pelt said in the interview published on Friday. Why can't I have Marvels that are both? Oh, so it's not an anti-women thing. He wants to see representation of both biological sexes on screen. Oh, he wants normal movies. Then he says, why do I need an all-black cast? This is talking about Black Panther, apparently. And that actually is a very fair question, I would say. In the same way that one might ask if there was an all-white cast, hey, why are we doing this? This isn't a good idea. Now, caveat, folks, if it's a historical or geographical necessity uh, to reflect reality, no, no qualms here with that whatsoever. Asked about Peltz's remarks. This is where we get devious. Disney spokesperson responded, this is exactly why Nelson Peltz Shouldn't be anywhere near a creatively driven company. And then the headline, why do I need an all-black cast? Disney criticizes Pelt's remarks. You get the idea how the game is played. Jonas, I think this indicates that Disney is getting desperate. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, I, yes, I, I absolutely think that they're desperate uh, at this point. Uh, they're, they're going after him for something that is kind of a misrepresentation. It's also not that uncommon anymore to of an opinion that that Marvel and Disney have a, missed the mark a little bit with their focus so much on messaging and 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 diversity not that diversity is bad but that they they seem to put it in front of everything there was that issue of Nia DaCosta being hired as the director of the Marvels because she is a a person of color and a, and also a woman and and then uh, some of her comments in the lead up to the release of the film seemed to indicate that she was pushed out of the editing booth, maybe actually pushed out of the director's chair in some way, as uh, as Bob Iger has made recent statements saying that he watches films five times. 
I I have to think that um, th that that people are seeing through this. If they're not seeing through this, I I really question why they aren't. Also, of course, the 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 full complete context of what Nelson Peltz is saying is behind a paywall at a website that uh, most people are not going to pay the what like uh, three hundred dollars a year for okay. access to the Financial Times interview. And thus the attack happens, right? Because people are not going to go verify it because it is, as you said, behind a paywall. Now, Culture, one of the things that's happening right now that's very fascinating is that ISS, following the George Lucas endorsement of the Disney board, ISS, which we believe controls, and we're going to put the word control in italics here because they don't literally control, but for all intents and purposes, they have huge sway over one-third of the institutional investors of Disney. And so ISS came out after George Lucas and declared that they were backing Pelts. Now that probably has essentially one third of the institutional investors following their endorsement of Pelts. Now they didn't endorse Jay Rusulo, but they did Pelts. And I, I think this, this feeds into that fear that I'm, I'm seeing from Disney. I'll explain. First of all, now it begs the question, did they bring out George Lucas uh, almost 80 years old, George Lucas, just prior to that, did they bring up that statement from him in order to try to null or dull the ISS thing? And then also, if you've got that happening out of ISS, uh, it's going to start to beg the question now, um, has Disney always known that ISS might go in that way? And is that why we're seeing these giant websites and all of this stuff? I mean, take a look at this. They've got a huge website that uh, has all these different directions on how to vote and uh, how to how, why you should hate Pelts and Rusulo, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come back to that in just a moment because there's more shenanigans there. But uh, Culture, do you get the feeling that Disney is now afraid, that Bob is now afraid after the ISS endorsement? I think he, they have reason to, to fear. And I think they're probably given a heads up that ISS was was going to come out that way. And I think that uh, if anybody knows, Iger knows just how powerful ISS is because in his book, when he, the uh, ride of a lifetime, which uh, his subsequent follow-up is going to be the crash of a lifetime. But um, he, he actually acknowledged that in his book that they, they, they do represent at least, or if not more of one third of the votes, um, the institutional shareholder services, they have sway in a lot of different, ways in a lot of different companies. So I believe they were given a heads up. And I, I think that's absolutely why we are now seeing political levels of mudslinging that you guys have been reporting on uh, extensively, both you and, and, uh, and Joseph are doing a great job along with everybody else like Bash and others. Well, I, um, I appreciate that culture. Your, yeah. your channel though is definitely no slouch here. Right. And I highly recommend, I mean, folks, if you're not subscribed to culture casino at this point, I mean, you're just, you just don't want to have a good time because he's doing such a phenomenal job with the channel. Oh, well, certainly wasn't fishing for compliments, but I would say that no, they're 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 put in a they're definitely put in a corner uh, where they feel that way. I mean, they they really are acting like they're they're not just in a you know a, yeah a, scratching a, and clawing at this point. Yeah, I, I would not be really I would not be shocked by you know what some might call an October surprise this coming week. Would not shock me at all if there's some kind of step made uh you know i don't want to call it a black swan maybe a maybe i probably shouldn't call it a black mouse either no. we'll just we'll just <laughs> say uh some kind of shock might be coming but vash cool. let me show you this um this is Please. this is on that uh, vote disney website i want to show you this this is very fascinating yes so this says pre-register and submit a question now for the annual meeting that's the meeting coming up april 3rd right and this is when just your average investor can actually talk to bob Iger. Once a year that, they, that this can happen, you can talk to the Disney CEO. Right. Now, this says the annual meeting of shareholders will be held virtually on April 3rd, 2024. Pre-register to attend and submit a question in advance by selecting submit a question. Hmm. Now, what this does is it gives the perception that they're going to screen all of the questions and that, you know, only those who have their identity tied to this and have registered and all that are going to get to ask the question. I'm here to say, I think it's more nebulous than that. I'm not sure that's the way they're going to do this because that would, it gets them in some trouble and it also is a terrible PR disaster if that's what they do. But it also could go that way. We're not exactly sure yet. We're actually doing an investigation into this. But uh, how important, Vash, is this upcoming uh, meeting with shareholders? We don't know what the vote will find, but uh, 
I, I'm thinking with this ISS endorsement, pelts may not go away. This if pelts doesn't get on the board, they've got another year of this. And I, I'm telling you, if he's if he's still fighting to get on there, how, how important do you think it is that Bob Iger handle shareholders' questions well this time? Oh, I think it's uh, absolutely paramount, and that's probably why they might be <laughs> sussing out what those questions might be on that day. Maybe not necessarily pre-screening, but sussing out what those questions might be. Remember, these things used to actually happen not virtually prior to 2020. They were actually physical. Uh, you could actually be in the presence of Bob and the board and ask questions and so forth in a physical space. Now it's all handled virtually, and that allows them uh, some more era of control right there. But I think, yeah, I, th I think the ISS, or the Institutional Shareholder Services, backing pelts was was a huge deal and i think i agree with culture's assessment i think they were tipped off that that was actually going to happen which is why they had lorraine powell uh jobs actually um uh, had her endorsement uh, on the same day that that iss announcement was made had her endorse the board and and uh, Ash, can, you, can you say right what there. the acronym means again iss yes the institution institutional shareholder services the, re the reason i asked you to do that vash is because mm -hmm. i realized now uh, many, many minutes into this video that if there is someone out there, perhaps a journalist, right, taking notes for tomorrow's headlines, right. those po the poor, poor person might have been thinking we were talking about the International Space Station the entire time <laughs> until you finally declared what the heck it is we're talking about. Yeah. So, Ash, I overlooked that significantly. Now, I'm not going to pull up an article for this next point that I'm going to hand over to Lorne. Um, mm. uh, no article needed here. I want to thank Valiant Renegade, Mexican Iron Man, and Echo Base Network for helping me figure this out. And, and they had they were hot on the trail, and I think Valiant figured it out in, in total. But, uh, Lauren, Lucasfilm came out, and they were celebrating that the Acolyte had record numbers of views in its first 24 hours. And that's, that's really something, because the Acolyte is headed to being one of the most disliked videos in the history of YouTube. So that, you know, special that. But um, a closer look at the statement from Lucasfilm reveals that what they're saying is that it has the most views of a digital only trailer. And the reason that they're saying it that way, Lauren, is because the Mandalorian season three, just the season three trailer had far more views, but it was also shown on TV in the first 24 hours. And so that's, that's the whole gimmick here. Lauren, Disney is filled with gimmicks and I, I call, I call it weaseling, you know, and weasel gonna weasel. Disney's constantly weaseling, the fine print is always obscure and in so, uh, font size too, but I think that that is coming to a halt. Lord, beyond the proxy battle, beyond Nelson Pels and how ugly this is, does the Acolyte trailer and its reception show that the mainstream, main street individual has caught on? I think they have. I don't know that you get that from the Acolyte trailer, though, because I'm not sure how aware what we would call normies are of the Acolyte. I think if they hear of it, they're going to go, what's that? What time frame is it in? Why is it important? Oh, it's it's more of what we've been seeing? Probably give it a hard pass if you're not a diehard fan. But I think what we're seeing out of box office receipts for uh, pretty much everything coming out, and the fact that you've seen a wholesale rejection of these kind of messaging in our entertainment products are signaling that the end is pretty much here. It's going to be uh, a while before they can get all of the product out of the pipeline that have been influenced by this. But I think part of what you're seeing with layoffs taking place at studios and in the media and everything else signals that... Um, the traditional media and the movie houses and everything are recognizing that there's likely to be some type of major political realignment and they're trying to get ahead of that and i think that's why you're seeing a lot of the actions taking place now because they're sort of seeding the ground to say oh yeah we see we we realized ahead of time that this this is not really the direction our audience wants us to go see how we're getting ahead of it and and catering to our audience they're trying to build in some plausible deniability for what they've been doing this whole time let me ask you guys this on the final uh, final note here. The, the trades have now started talking, and this is this is really gone even beyond the trades now. But it started in the trades, and that means that it's a Hollywood narrative. In the trades, they've been talking about how there's now a financial depression in Hollywood, in Southern California, and it's it's related to uh, the struggles that entertainment companies are are experiencing. And one of the critiques that's happened in the trades, and we've covered this in prior videos. One of the critiques the trades are making now is that 
certain corporations are blowing everything on kind of rigging the quarterly earnings. No, not rigging in an illegal way, but rigging in, in the way of throw everything you can at getting through the next quarterly earning for Wall Street, even if it is long-term highly damaging to your company and the industry. I think that's been aimed at Disney, although you know they don't say so, but I think that's got to be aimed at Disney. I can't think of too many other companies that are like that. Um, do you guys think that Nelson Peltz is going to stick around for another year if he doesn't get on the board this time, which now I think is 50-50? That's a major difference in the assessment I had uh, before ISS gave the endorsement. But do you guys think that Nelson Peltz would stick around for another year? And if he does, complicated two-part question here, I know, but if he sticks around for another year, do you think that Disney has blown all the gas in the tank and the car is coming to a halt at some point? Culture, you take the first step on that for me, please. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, uh, in, this is in reference to several articles coming out in the trades recently, that um, they, they're in a position where they aren't seeing as many productions, they're not seeing uh, as, as much effort put into putting uh, shows in place. They're seeing a lot more investment in foreign productions and foreign, foreign, foreign films and things like that. We're seeing uh, production move largely away from Hollywood. It's, it's affecting everything. Um, well, it, to the end of deciding whether or not that's actually, you know, creating this terrible economy in Hollywood, I would say 100%. And yes, they've blown their, they've blown the whole load. They've, they've, they've done that over the course of the last three years. And, and it's not just Disney. I, all the studios have been guilty of, 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 of gross expenditures. Um, you know, huge CapEx when it comes to the, the elements that they put their money into, which is streaming. Streaming is a bust financially. It doesn't generate the kind of revenue that linear television does even now. Um, it doesn't, it certainly isn't profitable. Linear television still generates a profit off of advertisement. And this, this problem would, would not exist had the studios decided to just leave Netflix alone, license their, pro their, their properties to them. And it's, it's exactly what all of us predicted all those many years ago. Now, I think I was talking about this in 20, I know I was talking about this in 2019. So when you, when you, when you're having these, these conversations and you're, you're talking about, uh, that you say, no, uh, Hollywood is it, it selling out all these studios, selling out for the investors and for a return uh, that is just grossly over exaggerated for so long, you don't have anything left. You, you've got nothing. This, this is, this is happening, not just in Hollywood though. It's happening in all corporations. You're seeing the, you know, profit at all costs mindset, uh, bringing companies to their knees. It, 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 at the same time that they've leaned so hard into politics that they can't, they can't possibly course correct because if they do, they get torn down by the very social media worshiping, uh, you know, uh, sycophants that, that have been running Hollywood for, uh, you know, the last, what, five, six, seven, eight years. That's a big I think, problem. I think you're exactly right. Uh, Vash real quick, please. Uh, Yes. I was just thinking his culture was, was talking about that, you know. It seems to me that Disney at least has been chasing headlines at the cost of of potential huge damage. And Moana too comes to mind because right. it's great for them to be able to do, to announce that for the prior earnings call, which is so important because they need to get the stock higher to stop Nelson Belts. Mm. So it's great to announce, hey, we've got this uh sudden movie that's coming out in November. Then it really sucks when you look behind the scenes and go, Oh, it's a studio that's never made a movie. It's a director who's never made a movie, and you're doing it in in six months as opposed to five years, which is what a typical musical takes to make. This sounds like a train wreck. So your thoughts, Vash? Oh, yes. I think uh, you've got a lot of people thinking quarterly and not necessarily thinking long term. And I think uh, some of the executive structure has been set up that way, especially within Disney, when you have a lot of people just... They're there at, to use Disney as a stepping stone to get to a, be a better place, right? They want that corner office of Nike necessarily. They don't want to be sticking around at Disney. So, yeah, they're going to do anything that they want to to pump up their quarters and uh, put that on their portfolios. Meanwhile, the company's left holding the bag of their bad decisions. We've seen that at the parks level for a little bit, and I think it's really starting to affect the studio level because you have to understand there's only so many franchises out there that you can possibly wreck before people become disinterested and people... Uh, <laughs> You know, they, they, right? How many do they have left? <laughs> that's what I'm saying right there. So, so that's what I would uh, I would be most concerned about right there is is you know you you've now you've taken this franchise mindset you haven't necessarily created anything original uh, you've damaged what you've had so you've reduced interest that way and now going forward 
you know, can you necessarily get people back into those theaters because that trust has been broken? I think that's the real problem facing Hollywood, especially in the West today. Lauren, does this work anymore? Or are all the stuff that we're talking about Disney, is it, has it become too much that this kind of stuff just doesn't work? Well, it doesn't work. But in answer to your question about what happens with Pelts, I don't think it really matters what happens here in the next week or so, because if he doesn't get on the board, the only thing that Disney can do now is fight a delaying action. I think it's inevitable that he will be on there eventually. There's blood in the water and there's no reason for Pelts to back off. In That's fact, a nice take and I like it. Keep going. I, I think... I think there's two things that Disney ought to really be thinking about right now. And uh, one of them, I think they probably already are and just aren't talking about because nobody wants to talk about it. And that's the potential IATSE strike that's going to be coming up this year. They already don't have anything really to release on the slate on the slate that is important this year. And if that strike kicks off again after they just had the two last year, they're going to have nothing for next year either. That's oh. a major problem. But bigger than that, they also need to be thinking about the parks in the sense that maintenance in the parks has gone down. You want to see something that could take Iger out? Somebody getting hurt. And if they continue not paying attention to their parks maintenance and things like that, that's the kind of black eye they cannot afford at any point now. So, I, so I mean, there, was, uh, there was a light on Main Street in Disneyland that fell and hit a woman in the head. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. You had the dragon catch fire last year, too. Both you know, dragons! All, uh, they've got two dragons on both coasts, and they both were burned to uh, rubble. Yeah, yeah that, that it, dragon incident could have been a fatal incident for sure. Yeah, if you have something like that happen, I think Iger's, they're, they're going to have to get rid of him at that point. Yeah, but so, we're, we're not wishing for that, folks. No. But, uh, no Disney's no, efforts to no. block Pelts may be uh, up in flames like those dragons. I, I think Lauren's right. I think Pelts is in it for the long haul. I don't think Pelts is going away. And I think that if this goes to another year, if he doesn't get on the board this time, four board seats are going to Pelts the year after. I've said that over and over. I continue to think it. I also want to say thank you, uh, panel, for being here today. Bash, I know you uh, squeezed this in. Very, very tight schedule for you. And uh, Jonas J. Campbell uh, had to hop in for just the amount of time he had and give his thoughts before having to leave. Culture and Lauren, thank you so much. Culture, I would, uh, I would brag about your channel more, but I think... We've already covered that, but folks, make sure you're subscribed to all of our guests, including Vash and uh, Jonas over on That Park Place, the YouTube channel. Now, folks, it's your turn. Like, share, subscribe, click it, stick it to the algorithms, it's the notification bell, drop a comment down below, low, low. And folks, as we always say at the end of these, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun. <laughs> Uh, well, well, huh? Well, what are you doing? Well, I was feeling really behind and uneducated on the, all the happenings in the entertainment world, so I was trying to work out a solution, specifically around 12 p.m. Eastern Time, and, uh, well, this is what I came to. That's, that's not what that means. Oh. But, uh, why wouldn't you just watch Midnight's Edge on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays? And on Tuesdays, on WDW Pro's channel, you got the Pro Show, and on Thursdays, you got that park place with Jonas and Vash. Jonas? That guy sucks. Well, feel free to jump in the chat and remind him of that regularly. <laughs> I won't feel free. I am free, baby. But I think you forgot something important. What's that? On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, there's something really special that happens on Floral's Under a Rock. Ah, right. Under a Rock. Where we don't simply talk about entertainment, we actually try to be the entertainment. Which, I mean, uh, Floral, you're, you're actually kind of dragging the show down, you know what I mean? Well, theoretically, you and everyone else knows now what's happening at 12 Eastern Time throughout the week. Yep. <laughs>